There's a global organization. Well, not quite, but it's very nice thing to say. Um, does anybody need me to do this in Czech? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's supposed to be a joke, because after 22 years, my Czech is not so fabulous and good. I speak Hungarian now, but I still couldn't do a presentation in that. Now, I've got to be quick. We've got 20 minutes. Um, LLP, what does it do? It does pretty dull things in a way. Uh, we, I shouldn't say that, we sell, we develop, we configure and support business software. That is fascinating things, fascinating for me at least, maybe for some of you. Accounting systems, I'm not an accountant, not a trained accountant, so I didn't begin my life in a dull kind of way. I hope I'm not offending anyone. But accounting, manufacturing, distribution, these kinds of things. Package software that we bring in from other countries, from Microsoft, from Info, an American company, which we adapt, we add to, and we sell in this market and elsewhere. Um, product sales amount only to about 15% of our business. It's probably a higher proportion before, but you know, the way the IT world is going, it's more and more about services. Of course, when you sell the product, you're also selling the support, 20% a year, the support and maintenance fees that go with that. I call that services, but that amounts up over the years. Just to give you some examples, one of our first clients here was Dr. Smith Klein, and they're still, still doing huge projects for them. And what we had to do for them in the early 90s was to make sure that their check accounting would work, as well as their corporate and the management of all their medicines imported from their subsidiaries and stock and so on. Another example, we were involved in the production of Rama. Is that still on the market? Yes. It's a margarine, yes. I think of moderate quality margarine. Yes. I think you will even know in Bertorelli as well, some better margarines, but I'm not a fan. But they needed software to manage the ordering of all the raw materials, the manufacturing process and the sales. That kind of thing. This was the biggest and most exciting project of my life. Most of you will remember that the MPs in the UK got into a lot of trouble a few years ago for buying, well, for, for buying services to clean their moats, pigeon lofts, all sorts of things, pornography, even on occasion, I think. Um, now they are strictly under my control. Uh, I designed the, I mean, we take our package software and we configured it so that all the MPs are only allowed to do certain things. And literally it will say, you may not spend more than £92 on a hotel outside London, and things like this. So, highly controlled. Great project. And in the CRM area, we sold uh, Microsoft CRM, which is a big part of our business, to come and and alter here. So these are just some examples, but it's basically selling software and then keeping hold of the clients and doing more and more services for them around that software hasn't changed, and that's one of the points that I'm going to make. We still do the same kind of thing after 22 years. What I'm going to talk about is the way we've had to change our positioning and uh, even the target market in some cases, but the basic skills that we have are just the same. It started with just me in 1992, and at the end of last year, in fact, until we sold part of the business, we were about 200 staff. So that's just to put Joe's lovely words in a little more perspective. About 200 around the region, including a, the region doesn't include Mexico, I would think, but we have a small company in Mexico. Won't tell you why. Nothing has changed, though, as I said, in terms of what we do. Effectively, it's been the same on an ever larger scale. And as I say, running fast, trying to do lots and lots and lots of things, but while still doing the same activities. The market conditions have changed radically. All of these things have changed, and that's meant different positioning, different messages, and of course using different media as well. 1992, who was here then? And Joe. Uh, a few of us were here then. <laughs> it was quite often called the Wild East, because, um, not I think only because corruption was endemic and crime everywhere, but I think because everything was new and everything was different. We were pioneers. This was me arriving um, for the funny hat on in, in about 1992. I had been working in Budapest for five years before I came here, and I saw an opportunity to bring a particular piece of software from the UK to sell here. 
to multinationals who were arriving. What was it? What was it? It was Sun Systems. That's on the next slide. Sorry. <laughs> Good question. Um, and the single service was me. Uh, our target market, and I'm ashamed about this, it was inbound Anglo Saxon multinationals. I suppose Unilever and you can count as Anglo Saxon, BlackSmith, Klein, Roche, PwC, all of these companies who needed a moderately powerful accounting system that would do local accounting safely and please those dragons who work in the accounting department, but also please the people back at headquarters who wanted to look at things from a management point of statutory perspective. And they wanted, they didn't want SAP in those days, sadly they want that now, because SAP was far too ambitious and there weren't the skills here either to manage the huge ERP products that are natural for these big corporations. Most of these corporations have now moved away from Sun System, which is sort of mid-market financial system, and I'll explain about that later, how we've had to adapt to it. Sales lead times were an astonishing one to three months in those days. Not like that now. How did I get them? Well, I knocked on the doors of embassies. The big six accounting firms, eager to sell their accounting expertise, were very eager to work with companies who had suitable accounting systems for their clients. So that worked very, very well. You all remember the what's it called, Proud Business Journal, the Proud Post, all those places um, which advertise bars where expatriates congregated, and also good places to advertise international software seminars, PR activities, all the usual things in the 1990s. Um, one product, one, ser one service. And we pitched it as being Western. That was not a negative thing in those days. It may not be a negative thing now, but it's not necessarily a positive thing. The fact that I was British was a plus. I don't think it would be now, and I don't think it should be, but it was then a plus. And we had a good track record and references, and we were still quite cheap. Even though the fee rates that we charged in the early 90s are higher than the fee rates we charge now. Which is interesting. You know, it was such a, such a good market to sell to. Because there were so few of us doing things reasonably well. We used the telephone, yeah. advertising, you know, all of these yeah. kinds of things. I say win working style because, you know, to wear a moderately decent suit, Mark Spencer would do, and a decent tie, you were already ahead of the game. <laughs> um, I called the company London Logic Prague. Prague. In fact, it was because I had a freelance company called London Logic before. Long story. We had clean shoes, we wore suits and ties, not like this. Um, we spoke nicely on the telephone. We would answer the phone and say, good morning, London Logic Prague. Not just, what do they say, Czech? Just, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, just, we were nicer and more marketing aware. We were punctual. We were all these things. And it was true in a way. I think we were more than confident. I'm being falsely modest here. But it was true. If you were moderately good at something, you could do well in the early 90s. This was the message, in effect. You can read that for yourselves. Um, this was the message I wanted to project. And one of the ways we projected, I had to reconstruct this. I, I was looking yesterday through our archives for the advertisements that we used in the 1990s. I wrote these because um, I thought it was fun. And these, there were some nice graphics behind it, but this is what we wanted to communicate. You know, people coming out here, were brave. They needed reassurance. They needed more than just two or three sandwiches or whatever. Um, so that was what we were marketing to, fear in a way. Isn't that one of the things that marketing is supposed to depend on? So what, are, what are they? Fear and Uncertainty humor and, and all those things. I'm, I'm no marketing specialist, but that was the way we projected ourselves, a reassuring presence in a difficult place. Did we differentiate? No. I don't think we did except perhaps with the suits. Um, and there was almost no competition, so that didn't matter. Looking at it in retrospect, which is convenient, um, the market demand was great, the competition was almost not there, and our message was very clear, a 
about what we want it to be and what we want it to do. Then, things, got, things changed in, in the 2000s, I think. You're familiar with this. Isn't this something that Vasa Klaus said? That all of these Westerners were coming here and they were offering soft advice for hard money. <laughs> and it's a typical sort of thing that he would say, but it was true in a way. We all, those of us who were here then, the, the big consulting firms, they were producing massive um, feasibility studies and so on, you know, charging millions to actually do it, not very much, really. Um, so, you know, confidence and skills were growing here. There was a proper growing distrust of, of, of Western advisors. Our market, our, these Anglo-Saxon inbound multinationals, they had already arrived by then, and they're already beginning to think, well, perhaps now it's time to move to SAP and Oracle, these bigger level systems. So it got, it got more difficult, and the sales lead time stretched, and we found ourselves trying to serve different kinds of company. So this was more difficult for us, and inevitably, and quite rightly, we focused more on our existing customers, and they took us during these years into other countries. That's why we grew, because, for example, Kraft, Jacob, Sushal, or Black, so they wanted the same people even to do their implementations in Romania, Bulgaria, and Hungary, and all those places. So we followed them there. But we had to change our messages a bit. Um, we were now these things. And I dropped the London logic because that was no longer appealing in any way. So we're just LLP now. Nobody asks what it stands for. And when they do, I say it's about them. When I have to, I say it's London Logic Hartman. Actually, we had one difficulty early on because we extended to Bratislava. So then I thought, well, that's London Logic Bratislava. And then we went to Budapest, and London Logic Budapest, and then Bucharest. And we had three, three LLBs and one LLP. It just didn't make any sense. So we dropped all of that. But it was also because was no longer special to be foreigner. That's how it should be. And we had to start targeting local people, so I had to do less of the talking. Um, we had to have very good, very competent local managers who could talk to the local financial directors. The market had changed in a way. High end was SAP and Oracle by then, everybody wanted that. And there were lots of very competent, low end software producers. We pitched ourselves as mid-market, value for money for international solutions. And we had the, this slogan, or what you call them, strap lines, um, positioning ourselves there. But I don't think it was good enough, in fact. Our differentiation was supposedly that we were regional, some specialist knowledge, still good prices. But we had, I think, in a way, slightly lost our target, because we were trying then, I think, to be too many things to too many people. The beginning of our market was very, very clear, and then that market sort of disappeared a bit. And then we, instead of specializing as we should have done on particular niches, we started to try to offer our services in a very generic way. We were still, this is one of our advertisements from this period, we were still to some extent trading on fear. But we also talk here about differentiation. It's, I think looking back, that's just about okay. This, I think, is pathetic in looking back. This is one of our emotions. It's such a cliche. You know, this is what people were doing then. I don't know what it says. We share a common vision of the future. It doesn't say anything really. It doesn't say what we do. I think you'd be hard pressed to have any idea about what we do from the advertisement of that. This was funny. But what's wrong with this, I think, in retrospect? Uh, so it doesn't say anything about differentiation. It just says we're a generic IT company and uh, people who've screwed things up, we can come and make it better. But in what specific areas? Not bad, but it's not clear enough about where it is that we're trying to sell, to whom we're going to sell, and what our messages are. <coughs> and so I think this, this was, in retrospect, it looks like a problem. It's quite interesting preparing this presentation, actually, because you, you, you look back nostalgically at all of these things, and you, you begin to see a pattern. It's the convenience of history. It's kind of fiction that fits the, fits the facts more or less. <laughs> so I don't know whether anything I'm saying is true, but it's plausible. <laughs> it's plausible. So the market had grown, the competition had grown immensely, and the clarity of our message, I think, had declined. 
very significantly. But now, of course, there's a lot of new tricks. Emerging Europe has emerged, has it not? I'm still not sure about Romania and Bulgaria, but I think that for most of Central Europe, I think we can say it's properly emerged. And all the buyers are local now. I think the number of expatriates um, living in this country is far fewer than in the 90s, probably, although some of them are still here. Um, and there's an intolerance of people like me who are lazy with their languages, or as I say, just speak a bit of Hungarian, and needs got more and more sophisticated. Um, and of course, the media have changed enormously. There's all these things about which I knew far too little some time ago. I'm spending a lot of time on this kind of thing. All of these things are important. We've even produced an app that goes with our expense system, which is partly designed just to get the, as a marketing device, just to get people aware of our uh, software through seeing it on the on the um, app store. You know, we're not expecting to make money out of that app, but it's a way of getting uh, people to know about us, really. But there's, I think, another thing that is going on, this is kind of very fairy theory. Um, we all, it's a cliche, social media, business media, they're all sort of coalescing now. And I think, actually, that's also in tandem with a change in the way we, we live and work. I no longer wear a suit, <laughs> and, and usually much stuffier than this. Uh, and I don't go to the office till about lunchtime, and lots of our people work at home, and I work in the evenings. You know, I think that's more, that's more the way we work nowadays, because technology makes it possible. Um, and I think, to some extent, because of those things, there's a greater emphasis now on individuality and diversity and those kinds of things. That's all rather airy fairy theory, but I think it's true. Um, certainly, we're working that into our marketing, trying to, for example, in the Facebook bits, trying to have more stories about our consultants, not about their professional skills, but about the other silly things they do and the silly things that our company does. So, I think it's it's changing, and communication has to be different in these different channels. So, for example, this is not this is about to go up on our Facebook. Site. Um, this is a snap from some charity work we do in Bulgaria where we sponsor uh, a theatre school. Um, but it's obviously not a hard business image. Perhaps one could criticise it in the same way as I criticised our earlier one of our advertisements by saying it doesn't tell, tell people what we do. But I think on Facebook that doesn't matter so much. Facebook, I think, is for people who already know about our professional stuff, and they go onto Facebook maybe for some more informal things. This is one of our professional web, um, um, websites, and that's you know it's much clearer, much higher, much less material than in the past, so they're becoming more succinct. Now we are in fact three companies, each with a very different market. LRP Group still sells Sun Systems and it concentrates on selling international consulting implementation services. Then we have LRP CRM which concentrates entirely on the Czech market at the moment and does LRP CRM. So very, very different markets and there's different messages for both. And then a third part is our software author uh, company, Systems of Work, which built the expense system for MPs. It's very much an uh, intellectual property oriented company. And its messages are very different. It's about a particular, very clear niche market. So three brands, three sets of messages, and everything tailored to each of those. We use Google AdWords a lot, for example, for systems at work because it's selling products in a particular niche. And people will go looking for expense management or professional services management or timesheets and things like that. So Google AdWords is good for that. But Google AdWords isn't good for LLP Group, which sells generic financial consulting services around Sun Systems, and we are not unique in that. Um, so we have to be very careful about that. But a few other last thoughts. I don't think this has changed. I have very strong views about how know-how kinds of companies should be marketed. And I think this is true. I don't think many of you are also know-how marketing. 
Um, I hate cliches. When I read people, things that say, we put our customers first, I want to vomit. <laughs> Uh, because it's just such a cliche. And you look at websites, you know, we're special because we put my, our customers first. Well, if you don't put your customers first, anyway, just saying it tells you nothing. And, you know, we're the best, we're the biggest, we're the cheapest, well, I wouldn't say cheapest, but all those things. Like, I am a stickler, maybe no longer for wearing suits, but I'm a stickler for good grammatical sentences. Um, and I insist, I, I don't mind if a website uses American spellings as long as they do it con consistently. And so I'm absolute stick. I go over the text and I say, if you want English, English website, it must be consistent. Because these things display uh, intelligence. They don't say you were clever, but they display it through good writing. Um, and I don't believe in you know, making false claims or outrageous claims about competition. I think we need to demonstrate the values behind the company through what the company does and through the way it projects itself, not say it. Also, very important to do these, to direct these messages internally. I think, especially in the know-how, people are in services-oriented company where people are out there trying to impress customers. They've got to have understood your values and be able to present them well themselves. So a lot of what we do is training our employees also to understand what we're trying to do. Um, so now I think the market is ever bigger, the competition is still there, fiercely so, but I think our message is very much clearer. We know to whom we're selling in each sector and we know what the messages are. And hopefully we're selling them well enough through all of those different media. And this is the convenience of looking back and applying a pattern to the facts in history. It was true that we were tremendously profitable in the 1990s, with tremendously high fee rates. The 2000s, we, we were com well, not even quite comfortably profitable, but we were profitable. And now we're profitable again. And I, maybe it's something to do with this clear differentiation. Because through differentiation, you can always achieve higher fee rates and higher prices. If you're generic, competing with everybody. Of course, there's fashion too. You would have seen different logos. This is something you have to keep up with as well. You know, fashions in websites change. Fashions in logos and strap lines change. We're in the middle of transitioning to the last one, which I think is nice. Nobody agrees about this. The last time you want to be left The one, no, the one, this one. That was how we started. Do you think the first one's better? Yeah, I like it very much. Oh, oh no! Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, it's wrapped up once again. You know, like things are coming back. It's like with, these, with fashion, with, you know, things come back again now. Yeah, like clever trousers and nice like suits. Yeah, you see with logos, I think a lot, a lot of companies in consumer products go back to logos from the uh, 50s and 60s again, at least in their market, not always in their yes. products, but in their websites. And yeah. Well, that's interesting. Maybe they're kind of trying to reinforce old fashioned values and so on. Mm -hmm. Like Hovis and those sorts of things. They still have. Pictures from the 1950s of people enjoying Hovis like but I'm not sure that it would work in IT though, because in IT you're always supposed to be ahead, not you. I don't think nostalgia is ever right in IT, because otherwise we could yeah. with hideous old IBM machines and so Anyway, I sent this out for people in the company to, to adjudicate. And of course, you know, when you ask that when you try to be democratic, you get a million different, different opinions. Including some graphics sent back to you, really truly atrocious photos. So, you can never get it right, but you have to keep changing. So that was why I said running faster stays still. You know, we're like um, like the Red Queen. You, you you may be doing exactly the same thing for 22 years, but you've got to do it differently all the time, and be aware of the shifting market, the shifting media, all those things. So that's what I mean. About. That's me done. Oh, I'm four minutes over. Sorry, John. <laughs> Any questions? No, I have questions later.